Hi, my name's Paul Francis and this is what w the first of what will hopefully be a series of talks about things we don't know about our universe. There are hundreds of astronomy talks you can find about things we do know about our universe. Us astronomers very much like talking about what we do know. It makes us sound good and um, it's very useful for getting money out of governments. But today I'm going to talk about some of the things we don't know um, based on my own research here at the Australian National University and talks with many of my colleagues. So for today, I'm going to talk about a rather big mystery. Where did the Earth come from? It's kind of important to us. We live on the Earth. Now, the puzzle here. We know that just after the Big Bang, the universe was full of hot, glowing gas. It was extremely boring. Everywhere you went, you know, over here, hot, glowing gas. Over there, hot, glowing gas. Down here, hot, glowing gas. And the gas was only hydrogen, helium, and little tiny bits of lithium, but no elements like carbon, um, oxygen, which are useful. Somehow, you're going to turn this into something like this. A lump of rock, by and large, with a thin layer of water and life forms and species like us on the surface. So how do you turn a cloud of hot hydrogen helium gas into a planet? Now, I'm not going to give you the answers today. Um, hopefully you'll have a more refined form of ignorance at the end. I'll tell you some of the things we do understand, some of the steps, but also I'll highlight a lot of the steps that we don't understand at this stage. OK, so let's get going. Um, so we know after the Big Bang we had this hot, glowing cloud of gas. Um, if this hot, glowing cloud of gas had been completely uniform, the same absolutely everywhere, then nothing would ever have changed. Space would have expanded, and instead of dense gas, you would have got thinner and thinner and colder and colder gas, but you'd never have formed any planets, any stars. Luckily for us, some parts of this gas were just a little bit denser than other parts. This is a computer simulation, and you can maybe just about pick out there are some different colour bits here which are a little bit denser. If we run the simulation, you can see what happens. These dense regions over here start sucking more stuff in because they have more mass, more gravity. And so as time goes on, the stuff is sucked into these dense regions. And right here in the middle would be one of the first stars. That's the theory. There's only one little problem. Where did these small lumps we had to begin with actually come from? So we do need these very small lumps to be there to begin with. Somehow the universe must be almost, but not entirely, the same everywhere. If you make these initial lumps too big, then everything collapses to form a black hole in about a millisecond. If you make them too small, nothing ever forms at all. You get no planets and no stars. So big mystery number one, where did these lumps come from? Our current best guess is that these actually come from quantum mechanics. Um, in quantum mechanics, which is a seriously weird theorem, so-called empty space is actually full of so-called virtual particles that appear and disappear all the time. And it, these are normally far too small to see. Um, but maybe in the very early universe, some of these virtual particles were appearing and disappearing in a random way, and then the universe expanded like crazy, and these very small virtual particles were enlarged until they became these huge fluctuations that eventually end up forming stars and galaxies, and us. So, if this theory is true, we all come from quantum noise. Okay, so... Uh, that gets us the first generation of stars, so these class clouds collapse. Now, these first stars are only made of hydrogen and helium, because that's all there was in the universe to begin with. Um, however, stars are nuclear reactors in the middle. They would stop producing heavy elements, like the carbon that makes up our own bodies. Um, but the carbon in the middle of a star is no use to anybody. We have to get it out somehow. And that's thought to be what happens when stars die. The really massive stars explode as a supernova. This is the remains of a supernova that went off about a thousand years ago and then squirt the gas out. Smaller stars um, have what's called a planetary nebula phase. When they get to the end of their life, like many of us, they become flatulent and start squirting gas out in various directions. Um, and this also can get these precious heavy elements like the carbon that makes our bodies, and the oxygen that makes our oceans, out into deep space. So this is thought to be where the elements that make our body com bodies come from. So there's actually a kind of a cycle of life going on. You have these clouds of gas, and then some stars explode. The dying stars squirt out this enriched gas with all the nice, yummy, heavy elements in it. This gas then collects into new stars, which form over here. New stars in turn explode and squirt out even more gas, and so on and so forth, a constant recycling. You also get new gas from the Big Bang raining down at all stages. Um, and this whole process, over time, will generate the heavy elements that are in our bodies, we think. It kind of seems to work. Um, the typical atom in our body, or the most common atom in our body, is hydrogen. 
and the hydrogen in our body by and large has come straight from the Big Bang without going through any stars. But all the other elements in our body, the, um, the iron that makes our red blood cells red, the calcium in our teeth, that's all been through at least one star. Um, on average, about four stars, it turns out. So we are stardust. There is a problem with this whole puzzle. Remember, there was this very first generation of stars, and this first generation of stars was made purely of hydrogen and helium. Now, big stars will go bang pretty quickly, um, only a million years, which for an astronomer is nothing. So the big stars go bang, squirt the gas out, that enriched, and that can help form us. But what about the small stars? We know that whenever stars form today, both big stars and small stars form. The big stars die and squirt out gas, but the small stars last a very long time. A red dwarf star, for example, which is the majority of stars in the universe, lasts about 100 billion years. But the universe is only 13 billion years old, which means no red dwarf star has ever died. So they should all still be around. We should still be able to see some of this first generation of stars, these stars with no heavy elements. And people have looked, including a number of my colleagues here at uh, ANU, and they've never ever found one of these things. This first generation of stars have, will have made heavy elements in the middle, but they shouldn't have got to the surface. So on the surface, it should look like purely hydrogen and helium, nothing else. And none of these have ever been seen. So we don't know what's going on. Something puzzling. They should be around, and they're not. But anyway, moving quickly on. So you get all these exploding stars and flatulent stars, and they squirt the gas out, and the gas swirls around in space to make beautiful patterns like this. These are called giant molecular clouds, and it's out of these that fifth-generation stars like our sun are thought to come. And here's some pretty pictures because they are very pretty. Um, so these clouds, in turn, they're, they're very turbulent, chaotic, swirling things, will themselves collapse under gravity. And here's a simulation of this done by Matthew Bate in England. Um, this is a computer simulation of one of these swirly gas clouds, and you can see it starts collapsing and forming denser regions under gravity. Some dense regions might be like stars forming here. Let's go stop for a second and zoom in on one of these things, change the color map, and watch the thing going again. So you can see that whenever you get a cloud like this, it will collapse under its own gravity, get smaller and smaller. And now these are the places where solar systems are going to form. And we'll run the simulation again. We don't know this is what it's really like. This is just a computer simulation. The computers aren't really powerful enough at the moment to simulate this very well. They get kind of close, but you have to make some fudge factors in there. But we kind of seem to be able to make this work. Now you're seeing stars form, and they're racing past each other, zooming in and out, crashing. And sometimes see these spinning disks of gas around stars, which is thought to be where planets form. So here's a nice spinning disk of gas. That might well be a solar system like our own in the act of formation. So, this bit we understand. Gas cloud collapses, forms spinning disk of gas. There are a few things we don't understand. For example, the gas clouds collapse about 100 times slower than they should according to our theories. We don't know why. But the overall picture, gas cloud, enriched by stars, collapses, it's okay. Now the next puzzle. We end up with a spinning disk of dust and gas around a newborn star like this. This is what happened in our own sun about 4 billion years ago. Now, in this disk, disk of gas, all the heavy elements start sticking together. Uh, there's a, a, a force called the van der Waals force, you may have heard about in chemistry class, which can cause these little tiny grains of solid material to stick together and form slightly bigger grains, like you're seeing over here. Uh, maybe icy grains in the outer part where it's cool and rocky grains in the inner part. And it's out of these tiny grains, too small for the eye to see, that we think planets form. So, start off, little tiny grains stick together, form bigger grains, stick together, form bigger grains, stick together, form even bigger grains. And this kind of works in our theories until you get to grains maybe the size of sand or size of gravel. The trouble is, you take your hand full of sand and throw it another hand full of sand, they don't stick. Or gravel, two bits of gravel don't stick together. So we have a bit of a puzzle. How do we, when these things are very, very small, they can stick together from chemical forces. When they're very, very big, like the size of mountains, they have enough gravity to stick together. But there's a range of sizes in the middle where by and large they don't stick. And so, in principle, we get the spinning disk of gas. It should form clouds of sand orbiting around it, and that's all that should ever happen. And so you never get planets. All you get is stars with clouds of sand around them. However, we seem to be sitting on a planet, so somehow they must have stuck together and got bigger. Anyway, it happened somehow. Um, the next stage is what I like to call the era of carnage. I'd like to show you a computer simulation of this. What I've done in the simulation is 
put a whole bunch of small planets. So we get the little grains sticking together, they form bigger grains, um, until eventually they get up to maybe things the size of mountains or maybe things the size of a small moon or a as large asteroid, and there are probably tens of thousands of these things orbiting around the sun. What I've done in the simulation is simulate this. I've put a few hundred of these things in random positions, and we can see what happens as they orbit around. So here we go, we sun in the middle, and we start off with lots of these small things in random positions. And what you'll see is they started affecting each other. Some three of them just collided over there to form this one. Um, you've got a green one in the clip, oops, just eaten that one over here. That one's got eaten this one. So you get this era of carnage when these things smash together. Ooh, we have a collision there. Yes, you have a collision over here. And you get a rather random pattern. Like at the moment, um, these two, I don't know what's going to happen with them. They're, they're pretty close orbits. I don't think they're going to survive. Are we going to have a crash over there? Yes. So it looks like in this solar system, we've got two monsters, a blue one here, a big one over there. I don't think they're going to last. So this is going to eat everything else. We can rotate the simulation. Put it from different angles. And every time you run it, you get a different story. At the moment, this solar system has got a giant planet very close in, which is quite different from our own system. And there's quite a big one out here, and then a whole bunch of small ones, including some that have been flung out. If I stop it and run the whole simulation again, you'll get a totally different solar system. And each time, just random events, random collisions will get you something quite different. So once again, you're seeing all the collisions here. And sometimes you get a big planet further out, sometimes you get a big planet further in, sometimes almost everything falls into the sun or gets flung out into deep space. So there's a whole element of randomness in this, which may account for many of the quirky features of our solar system, like the fact that some planets are spinning backwards. One final thing, it may, we don't really know the details of all this. There will have been some sort of era of carnage like this, and just the random events of what collided with which, when, probably set up a lot of things, for example, the seasons on the Earth. One idea is that, in fact, this is responsible for the, the formation of the moon. It's long been a puzzle that the moon is much less dense than the Earth. And one idea to explain this is that maybe we had two asteroids, maybe originally the size of Mars, much bigger than the moon at the moment, which collided with something a bit smaller than the Earth. And you see their dense cores in the middle, the green bits and the light fluffy rocks around the outside as it's smashed together. This proto-moon lost all its heavy elements that sank into the middle of the Earth, just leaving this long cloud of lighter elements, which is why the moon today is made of mostly light elements and doesn't have the heavy iron core that the Earth does. This collision may also have been what tilted the Earth over. Instead of the Earth spinning the right way up, it's tilted over at 23 and a half degrees. That's what gives us our seasons. So if this last random impact happened at a slightly different angle or been a bit smaller, we might have had no moon or four moons, or we might have had no seasons or incredibly extreme seasons that last um, a, a year at a time. So there's probably a whole lot of randomness in here. And that is our current best guess on how the Earth formed. So we started off with a cloud of gas, it collapsed because of some lumps. We don't know how they came from, quantum mechanical fluctuations, who knows. Um, and they had to be just the right size. And God had to choose to make them just the right size, otherwise we all collapse or we don't form anything at all. That's puzzle number one. Um, we then have the first stars that explode and generate the heavy elements that are in our body. Uh, but where are the small first stars? They've gone, we don't see them anywhere. These things in turn collapse and uh, form solar systems but we can't get this little tiny grains to stick together. But somehow they did and formed a planet like our own. Hope that all makes no sense to you. Thank you very much.